All right, good evening. We are in our last chapter of Book of Lamentations. And as such, um, we're going to kind of bring it home to what is, uh, what the Lord has been uh, dealing with us here. Lamentations chapter five is the fifth poem in a series of five poems. We said it, it um, it's like a mountaintop. It builds the two outer ones complement each other, the two middle ones complement each other, and the one in the middle is like the peak, it's the apex. It's um, the longest or the, the most developed and also the most hopeful in uh, this topic. Speaking of hope, um, that was one of the questions at the very end of last chapter, chapter four, was, is there hope? Is there no hope? And we're going to be looking at that a little bit more closely. But tonight, as we look into Lamentations chapter five, we have um, a couple of surprises. One is that this poem has rejected poetic form. And by that, I mean that it is not an acrostic. It is made up of 22 verses like the others, but it is um, not alphabetical. Um, people have tried to look at the patterns of the first letters to see if it has any special significance. And um, you would have to go, you would have to really stretch to see any kind of special significance from that perspective. Um, Kyle and DeLich observe, and I tend to agree with them, that Jeremiah only used the poetic devices as long as they serve the main communicative purpose. Poetry is powerful. Poetry moves us to emotion. It is expressive beyond the words that are being used. Um, it, uh, to say it another way, it um, is more than the sum of its parts. But this last poem, he abandons the acrostic and it's like he's getting down to the nitty gritty with God. In fact, this last um, poem is all directed toward God. It's all a prayer. And so in terms of prayer, I think that's the main um, goal that we're looking at here is understanding the nature of the prayer that um, Jeremiah was presenting. And this is a good place for mourning to bring us. Mourning should bring us to prayer. There's no other answer. There's no other hope. There's no other help. Um, at the end of the day, we have to hang our hope upon him. And so here in Lamentations chapter five, that's what we see we're doing. The first lines start out, remember, O Lord, remember, O Lord. So he begins with looking at the promises that God has um, made, or that's the illusion, shall I say. The illusion is... Um, the illusion is remembering the promises. Even though this isn't specific. Um, and we're going to see that as it develops. Uh, so really, the main... Remember them... And this is a cry of revival, a cry for revival. Um, there are several key verses in the scriptures that talk about remember, O Lord. 
And I think it's a very telling um, uh, passage. Anyway, we'll, we'll um, pursue that later. So let's start out with here in Lamentation chapter 5. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us and consider and behold our reproach. Now, why would looking at where we are be significant if we don't have an ideal in our mind of what it should look like, what our expectation should be like, right? So um, where should we be as a nation? And so he begins to specifically document the things that are wrong. But um, as we are looking at that, I wanted to bring out this this um, right here. The Lord brought a couple of verses in, in, to me this week as I've been thinking about mourning and, and literally wrestling with um, a, a very mournful state of mind because of so many things that I see and I hear. But First Thessalonians 4.13 says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And especially those last two phrases, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So our mourning should not be a hopelessness, but a hopefulness. And Matthew 5, 4 gives us a, um, a measure of hope in blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So, first of all, he's going to document the problems that he sees specifically. And um, you see here, uh, our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. Is there not an allusion to um, promises there? What is our inheritance? Where did our inheritance come from? And I'm thinking not from us as Americans or as Christians, but I was thinking at Jeremiah, his perspective as a Jew. What were the promises that he was building on, right? We are orphans and fatherless. Our mothers are as widows. So um, family members that have died, that have been carried away, and leaving them without help. Is this not an allusion to um, Ruth? Ruth. Um, is red and it is uh, an ideal representation of the way God takes care of his people. We have drunk in our water for money. Our wood is sold into us. Now the even the people who are left living in the land, um, they have no status, right? They are the water carriers and the wood packers for the people in the land. It, um, the big houses are occupied by Babylonians. Um, the Babylonians have built their villas, and now they are servants in the very houses that they used to live in. The very woods that they cultivated, now they're chopping and having to buy from the Babylonian invaders. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. 
we have given the hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. They, um, given the hand here, um, is talking about indentured servitude. Um, they have made, they have basically had to indenture themselves just to be able to make it. They've come under slavery. They're hot to up to here. You know, verse seven, I really like verse seven. Um, our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Jeremiah is acknowledging that, um, uh, Okay, let me back up for a second. As Jeremiah worked through the issues of the Old Covenant and how it demanded retribution, it demanded justice, it demanded um, fire, right, as penalty for sin, God gave him some enlightenment concerning the New Covenant that was going to be a covenant written uh, upon the heart, and it was going to be a regeneration and a rebirth. And he, um, Jeremiah, you know, had that moment of ecstasy and that moment of clarity and that moment of revelation. And now looking back over the, um, you know, over his notes and looking back over the events that have happened, you know, he has this question in his mind um lord you said that you know the old the old statement was brought the fathers um eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge but now you said i will do a new thing but what do we see what is our reality our reality is that our fathers committed iniquity and we have borne their iniquity. And there's an issue here that is really interesting um, about uh, one is about grace. The second is about going that next step of absolute uh, surrender, of walking with God. And I think this is so crucial to our, our message today. Um, to enter into God's work is a is an act of freely giving up ourselves. It's not a coercion. To enter the ministry is not a coercion. To, to be called of God, to do his work, is not cannot be based on coercion. It has to be something that we freely give. Uh, the example of um, submission, I think, is so telling in Ephesians chapter 5, 21 and 22. Um, and so I'm going to have to leave it right there. But the point is that submission and surrender are things that we do freely. Um, whenever a, a, a wife submits to her husband, it's not something he demands or something he expects or something that he um, 
you know, works in her. It is something that she chooses to freely give because the command is given to her. It's not given to him. And if a man is putting any kind of pressure or any kind of um, external force or any kind of manipulation, then he is completely ruining that possibility of, of free submission. And God doesn't work that way. Um, if we go all the way back to the beginning, Adam and Eve, he gave them a, a choice. And so our entering into his work is a, a wonderful opportunity. And it's a choice that we make. After that, we see an overturn of society. Um, verse 8, the servants have rule over us, or people who used to be servants now have rule over us. There is none that doth deliver us out of their hand um, because they, um, you know, they didn't grow up with any kind of grace. They don't know how to show grace to the remnant there of Israel. I mean, they're getting their just dessert, but just the fact that there is no grace there is um, very telling. We get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. I mean, if you have to, you know, it's dangerous to go out of your door. If you have to go out into the wilderness to do anything, you've got highwaymen, you've got robbers. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. I mean, they still haven't they haven't even recovered from the famine of Jerusalem, and now they're expected to do all this work. Um, you know, they raped the women and maids of Zion and, and the cities of Judah. The princes they hanged up um, and make a spectacle um, instead of giving the elders honor. They make them the butt of their jokes. Uh, they take the young men to grind, and the children fell into the woods. So the young men, anybody that has any kind of energy, um, you know, and this makes me think of the concentration camps, right? They're getting the last bit of of work they can out of them. The children are, the, the, the loads that they're trying to ca carry are so heavy that they keep falling under them. They're carrying loads of, of wood, of firewood, and they keep falling. The children have ceased from the gate. I mean, sorry, the elders have ceased from the gate and the young men from their music. So legitimate places where they should be. Where should the elders be? They should be in places of authority, in places of leadership. Right? They should be sitting in the gate. They should be exercising um, judgment and conducting policy. For the city, but where are they? They're not there. The young men, what is the young man? I mean, what about the youth, youthfulness of them, right? They're, it, it's all about love, it's all about excitement, energy. The world is, you know, your oyster, you take it, you, you know, you take the world by the tail. Um, everything is a song. And there is absolutely no music left in Israel. So all this is just backward of what it should be. And so happiness. Is happiness something that we should even expect? Is this, is joy, is peace something that we should expect as Christians? Is it something we should strive for? Um, because it's set up here as an ideal that should be there, but it's not. The, can any of you relate? <laughs> the joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. We who used to be an empire now are under empires. Woe unto us that we have sinned. So this confession... Um, you know, what did, what did David say in Psalm 51? Uh, Psalm 51, 
Psalm 51, he said, um, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Renew within me a right spirit. Right? Take not away thy spirit from me. Renew within me a right spirit. Um, cleanse me from my own iniquity. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be white. Our, um, this our heart is faint. That's what he says in verse 17. For the thing, for these things, our eyes are dim. There is, um, they're in a, a constant depression. They have no energy. They have no um, zeal. They have nothing to drive them. They have no drive in life. Um, they have no clarity of thought. They have no vision for the future. Um, they're in this condition of deep depression because of the mountains of Zion which is desolate the foxes walk upon it these are I mean it's overrun by wildlife the place that should be this grand castle this grand um, location um, it's overrun by wildlife. It's sitting in ruin. It's becoming a site for archaeology, you know, in 3,000 years. But he doesn't stop there. He continues on in his prayer. These, these are words directed to the Lord. These are the words that are acknowledging the Lord as the source, acknowledging the Lord as the one with whom we have to do. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. Lord, you're everlasting, you're eternal. You look at things not in just this one moment of time in which we are stuck. But you can see what was before and you can see what's after. Lord, your greatness of sight, don't let this one moment overwhelm us. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Lord, you can go back and see the promises that you made. You remember what you said based on that bring us out turn thou us unto thee O Lord here we have grace right we don't even have <laughs> we don't even have the the ability to repent ourselves we don't even have the strength to turn ourselves around we can't make ourselves better we can't increase our faith we can't muster up enough um evidence of your work but lord you can do a supernatural work in us turn us turn thou us unto thee it's not just turning but it is specifically um Restoring that fellowship, restoring that relationship. Renew our days as of old. Repent, restore. Re uh, so we have repent and renew. Repent and renew. Those are what my grandpa used to call the re words in the Bible. He loved the re words. It says the re words have such promise in them. Repent and renew. Unfortunately, the very last verse of this, um, the very last verse of this psalm, of this song, of this poem, is not happy, is not joyful. Um, but. We understand that there is hope within that, right? 
But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. Based on our our um, based on our the evidence, based on our reality today, we're in a very bad spot. But we have hope that this won't be forever. As we use these words to meditate on what God is doing, what God is accomplishing, um, and how he's brought us over the last few weeks. What is this, eight weeks now um, in the study of Lamentations? I feel like I'm in more lament now than I was to start with. But at the same time, I feel like God has prepared us to um, to be able to face it. And what we need is to understand what are his promises, what is the ideal that he has set before us. The ideal is not a hope in this world. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about Abraham. Abraham had a very highly developed theology, according to Hebrews. He had um, a belief that if his son died, he would be raised because all the promises of God were in terms of this son. That was one thing. So he, he went forward, not in his own strength, but in a, an assurance of the resurrection. The second one is that he wasn't looking for a temporal kingdom. He said if he had been mindful of that city, he, he would have gone back to Ur. The Chaldees. I mean, that was the biggest city, the 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 center of civilization at that time. Um, you know, if if he was looking for a city that had foundation, but he was looking for a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for a greater place, a more uh, robust belief. Something that would show him um, something that he could hang his hat on that would go beyond the grave. His hope was not in this world, but in the world to come. And that's what our hope is as well. So remember, O Lord, and Lord, turn us and renew us. Renew is such a wonderful word. Renew. And renew can be true every day. Renew. Every morning. Renew. Every moment when we have recognized our sin, when we see the effects of sin, we can go to God and say, oh, Lord, remember, renew. Return us and renew us. And may that be our prayer tonight.